Cindy, actually. And that's that's Cindy sitting in the background there looking all nice and comfortable. Hi, Cindy. Um, I met Jim and Cindy in Tanzania um, in 2007, and we've been friends ever since. Uh, uh, Jim has led um, many photo safaris, and I'm, um, let me see. Well, I'll just read you his, his uh, bio. Jim Griggs has been involved with photographic education since 1980. Additionally, his images have been published and used in way too many ways to list. He has done assignments for the Nature Conservancy and has been an instructor at Wilderness Photography Workshop since 1984. By the way, that's Boyd Norton, and we all know and love Boyd Norton. He and his wife have just concluded their ninth and tenth photo safaris in Tanzania. In addition, Jim has led four photo trips to Peru and two to the Galapagos Islands. And here he is, Jim Griggs. Do I have sound? Yes, you do. Okay, good. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat for you, Jim. Okay. So I will, I will rudely interrupt you if somebody has something super important to say. Otherwise, just know that I'm here. Okay. Okay. Let me see how do I do that play. There it is. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to talk a little bit. First, my disclaimer, I've only been to Tanzania. I haven't been any other place in Africa. So I can only talk seriously about Tanzania, but I, I've got friends who've been to all the other places you want to go. And, and um, I've sort of compared them. I think I, I know why I like Tanzania. But, you know, we did our first one in 2001, uh, seven, with uh, which we met Ellen. 11, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. There's a trend going there. And it quit. I, I took 2019 off. We're going to go back in April 2020. And we all know what happened in April 2020. COVID hit. Um, we spent every waking moment for the next, for about two and a half weeks, three weeks, uh, postponing everything for a year. But we had back to back trips planned for the whole month of April. We put them, put them off till April 2021. Uh, and then in March 2021, we spent two and a half, three weeks can't, uh, postponing it again till November of 2021. We finally got those trips done in the month of November in 2021. Um, sort of took, in fact, I had I had jet black hair until that those two postponements. So um, sort of took the wind out of my sails for for leading trips to Tanzania or anywhere for that matter. So we're uh, we're doing some other things this next couple of years. Uh, in addition, we were involved in a uh, Christmas Eve on 2021, involved in a head-on collision with a drunk driver. So uh, last year was kind of a lost year for us, but we're back and uh, going strong. Cindy played golf this week and playing again tomorrow. So, and I've been playing off and on for quite a while. All right, safari comes from a Swahili word, kusafiri, that means to travel. Um, that's a, the root word for a safari. And if you can only visit two continents in your lifetime, I say visit Africa twice. All right. I know some of you have been to Africa. Where to go? Africa is a huge continent. Um, choices are a lot of choices. South Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe. Namibia. I think they lead safaris. Uh, Botswana. I? And uh, Tanzania. And I, 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 mean, I know there's other, other places there too, Uganda and Rwanda, especially for the gorillas. I've always said that there's plenty of choices, but I went to Tanzania first. And the more I, the more I go, the more I love that place. It's, uh, the government's quite stable. <laughs> Tourism, tourism is very large. It's a, it's a big industry, and the tourists are well cared for. And three, there's a lot of wildlife, and on top of that, spectacular scenery. And I'm going to get into the, the pros and cons of, of why I like the, the scenery in addition to the wildlife. So the two major places I like to go there in Gorongora Crater, um, it's uh, basically 10 miles in diameter. And over 2,000 feet deep, it's actually a collapsed caldera from a volcano that exploded millions of years ago. 
Um, it's got almost everything that exists in East Africa down in the crater, except for impala and giraffes. And the impala aren't there because there's not the right kind of trees, not kind of right, right kind of uh, environment for them. And uh, we're told that giraffes have never uh, survived the descent into the crater because blood pressure in their heads. Um, Serengeti is a little different for us. It's it's um, it's a, it's referred to as the crown jewel of East Africa. It's the home to the largest migration of herbivores in the world and it attracts tourists from all over. And honestly, starting in 1984, Boyd Norton tried to talk me into going to Africa with him, and I honestly I've been to uh, I've been to Africa. I mean, I've been seen enough you know, Tarzan movies. I didn't think I wanted to go to Africa. And he came to visit us in Kansas, and I took him out to the tall grass prairie. And we're walking around out there, and he said, "Do you like this?" I said, "Well, I know it's you're from mountains in Colorado, and you like that a lot better, but." You know, the prairies have their own ecosystem. They're pretty exciting to be here. He said, no, it looks just like Serengeti. The next year we were in Serengeti in 2001 um, and just basically fell in love with it. So where exactly is Tanzania? It's a couple hundred miles south of the equator and just below Kenya. And the area that we do our trips to is right in the north central corner or north central part of the, the country. And uh, it's sort of like, it's called the Northern Safari Route. So you arrive in uh, um, overnight flight from the US somewhere into Amsterdam. From Amsterdam, it's an eight plus hour flight to uh, Kilimanjaro Airport in a, a pretty decent sized plane. And you unload and go through all the custom stuff and then head for a hotel. So I'll just point out the, the main places that we go and what's available there. First off, the highest point in, in Africa, Kilimanjaro Mountain is right here. It's just slightly under 20,000 feet. This is the Kilimanjaro Airport, the town of Arusha, where we spend the first night and the last day before we depart to come home. Uh, depending on the season, we go to Tarangira National Park. Um, used to go to Lake Manyara. I've kind of canceled that. They had some, the lake levels have been fluctuating quite a bit because of uh, the use of water upstream for agriculture. And then, of course, Ngorongora Crater and Serengeti National Park. The green is Serengeti National Park. The brown is the Serengeti ecosystem. So the park itself is about, uh, Serengeti National Park on its own is about four to five times the size of Yellowstone. The whole ecosystem is about eight times the size of Yellowstone. So it's quite large. Um, and those of you who have been there know that uh, it's it's blessed with probably the nicest road system uh, that isn't there. It's really rough. It'll beat you to death. Uh, pretty, pretty rugged uh, trails and drives that we take. The last place is this little place called Arusha National Park. And we've, uh, we've been there four times, I think. And uh, basically we've added that to our itinerary when we have to in order to meet KLM's flight schedule. So we'll add an extra day and everybody goes to Arusha National Park. Uh, that said, there's some pretty cool stuff in Arusha. I'm not gonna show you tonight, but there's some pretty cool stuff in Arusha National Park that you probably won't see um, anywhere else in, in Northern Sarah, uh, northern Tanzania. So we, we do what are, what are called photo safaris. And a photo safari is uh, has limited number of people. In this case, there were three of us in the vehicle. Probably Cindy was there too, but uh, three or four people per vehicle. The vehicles have eight seats. One's for the driver guide and the other seven are for us to figure out how to, to split up. The other choice, you know, the, the other type of safari is basically a sightseeing safari. And you can see on these that, uh, you know, the, you won't see big cameras, you see a lot of, uh, cameras with uh, built-in zoom lenses that are fixed. Um, well, I don't know, there's a binoculars and, and any, recently it's all more, more like iPhones and iPads for, for cameras. Uh, a friend of mine went on one of these because he said he, it was, he couldn't afford to go on mine, so he went on one of these and saved him about $1,500. He had a, uh, the biggest lens he had was a 70 to 200 2.8. Uh, and he said his, <laughs> He said it was kind of exciting as a family with two kids, and the kids never sit still. 
they're always asked to look through his camera. Um, they saw a lion, they take a picture of it and they'd leave and go do something else. They left the, the lodge every morning at, at 9 a.m. and they'd come back in the afternoon at three. So they're out in the middle of the day when the lions are asleep and the activities are at the lowest. Uh, his description of me was quite vivid and I went and found this photo to show you. He said, it reminds you of those trains in India where uh, people are just <laughs> crammed onto the things. Said he'd never do that again. <laughs> So how do they cut costs to get these things cheaper? Well, number one, they put more people in, but they also limit the daily hours the drivers can drive. They limit the daily miles they can drive. Uh, they can find the vehicles to the major roads, none of the off-road areas or the, 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 the minor uh, pathways. They're not really, I, don't, I hate to say anything about roads in, in Serengeti and, and in Gorongor. They're not really roads or paths. Um, they also reduce the maintenance on their vehicles and they use less experienced guides, the guys that are right out of guide school that haven't got the, the uh, experience yet to, to move up in the, in the world of the guiding. They fill every seat. Uh, 2021, November, last time we were there, we were out photographing some lions on, on some rocks and uh, two vehicles pulled up loaded with people. And I just looked over at their tires, took a picture of that. Um, they were slick. And I looked at the two spares as we backed out. They were slick as well. So there's a two groups of people out there, 20 miles from any lodge, um, in vehicles with six slick, slick tires. And when I was a kid, we call these mago slicks because they may go out anytime. And I don't think I'd want to be trapped out in the middle of Serengeti with it, um, with uh, no tires I could use. All right, the other thing that, that sets um, the real good tour operators apart from the, uh, the lookalikes is the guides. And we, uh, we were passing out a 33 page guide by the time uh, we stopped doing these in November last, uh, 2021. Um, it pretty much explains everything you need to know about health precautions, what to bring, what to leave at home, about the country, its people, customs, and simple do's and don'ts. Um, it also had information on, on like the power there and, and what kind of adapters you needed and, you know, bring an extension cord that we only have to plug in to one power outlet and you can then plug all your other stuff into that. As long as you've got something like uh, all your AC equipment says 100 volt to 240 volt, it'll work fine in Tanzania, which is all two, 230, 230 volt. The other thing that we have in there instructions like uh, when you get to your tent or your lodge, whatever kind of place or hotel even in Tanzania where you're staying, first thing you do is take out a washcloth and lay it over the faucet. That's to tell you, you don't use this water to brush your teeth. You uh, use bottled water to brush your teeth. In fact, we tell people for the first, the, the two weeks before you depart, get a water bottle and brush your teeth with a water bottle at home. So you get used to doing that. And that, um, it saves a lot of, uh, um, just call it headaches later on the, in the trips. Photo gear, um, I'm, you know, I, I used to shoot all cannon and I've gone to Olympus now, but it, it's the most important thing is, yeah, bring a backup. Whatever you're going to shoot with, make sure you got something that's will take the same lenses and use it as a backup, mainly because, um, there's not a Best Buy anywhere there. There's no camera stores anywhere there. Uh, whatever you take over is what you've got to use. And if it fails, you're out of luck. So I always carried at least two camera bodies. Uh, Cindy always brought a bridge camera, which is a fixed lens, super zoom. She had been using Panasonic, has now gone to the Sony RX10 um, type of camera. I carried a wide angle zoom lens, a medium zoom lens and a telephoto zoom lens. Uh, I see a lot of people carrying prime telephotos. I carried a 300-2.8 for a while with a 2X. The, the problem with those are your, is a fixed, a lot of times it's a fixed distance from what you're shooting to where you are. And uh, it's hard to do composition that way when you can't move around, you can't get, get off the road and get closer. Your only choice to, is to zoom with your feet and that involves getting out of the vehicle. And once you leave the vehicle, you're entering what's commonly referred to as a food chain. 
and you're not the, at the top, unfortunately, at least not in Africa. I did one trip prior to um, digital, and Cindy carried a backpack that had 125 rolls of film in it. So 36 exposures per roll, that's about three days shooting now in digital. I shoot anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 shots a day uh, when I'm in Tanzania. Tripods, um, don't need them. You don't really need a tripod. They're, they're kind of impossible to use in the vehicles and you're not gonna have time in the evenings unless you're gonna do some star shots and you really don't need a big tripod for that. You, I, I use a small one. We use bean bags and the bean bags are used to stabilize the camera. I'll show you in a minute. Should always buy a bean bag, a commercial bean bag. Do not make your own. Um, if your bean bag gets wet and our guides, when you first show up, you give them your bean bags, they fill them up with actual beans. And if they get wet in about three days, you got sprouts. In about five days, you've got stench. Uh, maybe a nice strategy for getting your own vehicle because nobody wants to ride with you, but um, make sure you get one that's waterproof and it's a commercial bean bag. It'll hold up pretty well. The tour company that, that we've been using over there since since I went with Boyd the first time, um, they are now supplying the bean bags. Um, I don't know. I mean, they, they're okay. They're big. They're heavy. They're bulky, but they do work quite well. Still like to have my own there for certain certain things I want to do with it. This is basically the bean bags that are used on the roof or on the windows. They rest to support the camera. The guides that we use um, are used to working with with professional photographers. So they know when you pull up and stop, they shut the engines off because that vibration could really um, really make your images bad. I mean, it'd be soft, nothing really sharp. The only other thing you have to worry about is other people in the vehicle moving around. So we kind of suggest that what you do is before you move, if somebody's shooting, you say, is it okay to move? Just ask. And they'll say, hang on a second, click, click, go ahead. You can move wherever you want. And that, that keeps from uh, uh, having cat fights in the vehicles <laughs> over people moving around. Just kind of be, you know, do, do like how you'd want to be treated there. I do carry a small little fold-up tripod that I use for doing night shots if you get a chance to. I will tell you that if you're going to do that, let the let the uh, camp people know or the the uh, people in the and the uh, lodge because they'll send somebody they they will send somebody out there with you. I went out one evening. I told them I was going to do it. Uh, this is in Samitu Camp in the middle of Serengeti. So I want to go out and do some night shooting. The stars are spectacular. Uh, the guy told me, yeah, just don't get too far away from your tent. So I went out to where the light normally is. It was turned off. And I set everything up in the tent and I went outside, set the camera up. I'm ready to take my first exposure. And to my left, I heard a lion kind of bellow. And I thought, hmm, that sounded pretty close. And I, to my right, I heard another lion bellow. And I said, well, I don't need star shots tonight. So I gathered everything up, went back in the tent. So. Um, that's my story of, of how to survive in Tanzania. Is don't worry about night shots, unless you got some place where you got somebody can be out there with you. One of the uh, one of the guides. We got a lot of questions. Um, should I bring a canteen? No, we have all the bottle you want. You know, bottle of water you want. Uh, the canteens are not necessary. Uh, they carry case after case of bottled water. We got as much as you want. And they encourage you to drink a lot because it's it can get warm during the day. How many changes of clothes will I need? The camps lodges offer laundry service at very very reasonable rates. Um, generally, we'll be packing up clothes for three maybe four days, uh, and uh, don't have any trouble at all with with running out of of clothes. Do you need special inoculations? Well, it depends on what country you're going to and what the current guidelines are, and it's all put out with us. CDC, the Center for Disease Control. So you can find out about whatever country you're going to visit. It doesn't matter if it's Tanzania or you're going to South America or wherever. You can find out what kind of uh, shots you need and maybe what kind of medicine you should take along. Travel insurance, it's a good idea to make sure that you have an insurance policy that includes cancellation and medical. 
that covers the entire trip, and we highly recommend doing this. It's um, if you had to evacuate out of there, that is not a cheap deal. It could to, to fly from there to Nairobi for medical care at a hospital could be very very expensive. All right, passport. Make sure it's valid for six months following your uh, your trip, because they want they want to make sure that you are actually going to get out of there for your passport expires. Packing list. Uh, we basically talk about it. restrictions on luggage is the big thing, but um, some people have to travel with the kitchen sink. We travel pretty light. Um, some of the flights, internal small aircraft we take, they have restrictions on size and weight of what will fit in their in their storage areas. And then the vehicles have the same sort of requirements. Uh, they like to have duffels that are rolling duffels or just duffels that are, can be massaged into shape to fit into uh, corners and into locations. When including your clothing choices, uh, things that don't require ironing, uh, also a broad brim hat. It can be very hot and sunny, especially in Serengeti and in Gorongora Crater. And there's chances for rain. If, if it depends on what time of year you go, you should wear, uh, bring along uh, rain resistant stuff. You don't really need it. And in, in the, the vehicles that we use are all, they have closable tops. So I've shot quite a bit, quite a few images in the rain. Voltages, like I talked about earlier, if your, your devices, um, are good for 220 volt, then there you don't need a transformer. You just plug in with your adapter and uh, you'll be really happy because your batteries charge quite a bit faster with this 220 volt than they do with 110 volt. Plan on shooting at least double the number of images that you do when you're on a trip in the US. Uh, I've shoot 1,000 to 2,000 images a day. I think the record for our, our, somebody on our, one of our trips was in 11 days, shot 36,000 photos. Heaven help them sorting through that and trying to figure out what the good ones are. Uh, I, I don't think I could go through 36,000 uh, photos without pulling my hair out. All right, how do you store them when you're on the road? Um, my daughter has, she's got a really th neat thing she does for her wedding. She puts, uh, she has a box that has SD cards in it. She numbers them with a big felt marker, one, two, three, four, five, and, and shoots them in order. And then stores them back in that waterproof, watertight uh, container. And she doesn't do that in Africa, but for her weddings and stuff, that works very well. If you're going over with a somebody that's not really a, a hardcore photographer, they're using a, a bridge camera, you can get by doing this way if they're shooting JPEGs. You can just fit everything you want in, in 10 or 15 large. Uh, SD cards. No backup, by the way, when you do it that way. So you want to protect that little case of cards pretty well. I use a small laptop with a card reader built in and two small, two small portable drives. Um, I, one of the drives is the main that is a backup. Every day I download and I call it Safari into a folder called Safari Day 1, Safari Day 2, say Day 3. And I just keep going. And then when I my backup drive, all I have to do is copy what I what I did today and not everything over again. So it's just I'm just copying up, copying over to the backup drive what I shot the most recent day and just downloaded. I use a couple of either one terabyte or two terabyte external drives that I carry with me on the trip. I do backups every night. We had a, a guy on one of our trips, Ralph uh, Lewis. Uh, I, some of you may know Ralph. He brought two hard drives along, and then he didn't have a computer. I told him you don't have to. He said he said he had plenty of cards. Uh, four days into the trip, he was out of storage space, so he uh, he asked if he could back up using my computer. So he brought his uh, cards over and one of the hard and both one of the hard drives. We backed it up. I said, Ralph, go get your other hard drive. So I don't know one's enough. I said, No, it's not. Go get your other hard drive. So he did. We backed up the other hard drive. When he got home, the first hard drive was dead. Wouldn't wouldn't even be recognized. So he would have lost everything he did the first four days if we hadn't backed up to uh, to two drives. When you're going over, you should pack all your photo gear and your carry-on. I, I use a photo backpack. Um, 
if you need to, put your large lens hoods in the check luggage. No batteries. Check, TSA has all kinds of restrictions on what can and go in, can and cannot go into your carry-on or into your uh, check luggage. I wear a photo vest, and it seems to sound sort of stupid, but I, I cram stuff into the pockets. I've got hard drives in there. I've got chargers. I've got batteries. I've got um, you name it. I've got it in there. And uh, I've never had anybody question it. I mean, I look like, like I say here, I look like the Michelin tire man, but my stuff gets there. And there's no way to replace it or find it in Tanzania that I know of, at least not in uh, Arusha. So that's that's just some highlights about things you should think about going over there. The, the, the thing that most people are are excited about is the animals, the wildlife, wildlife there, and it's everywhere. But there, there's a drawback because when you come home, I, I learned this on my first trip, came home in 2001, and all my friends were looking at my photos. I'm showing them the slideshows. And first question I got was, what did it look like over there? And I'm like, oh, well, here's a lion. I said, yeah, but what did it look like? Well, here's a leopard. Yeah, but what did it look like? Well, here's an elephant. <laughs> I didn't have any scenery. All I did was take pictures of animals because that was where my brain was. I went to Africa, Africa's animals. So I photographed animals. So the second trip back, 2007, and Ellen remembers this, I shot a lot of scenics. And I, I said, I've got to do more scenics because I, I got to have that in there if I'm going to tell the story and let people see what it's like being there. So it's, it's easy to get locked into the wildlife and neglect the scenery. So I shoot a lot of scenics. And, People that you do programs for will think, wow, this is great. We get to see what it looks like there. When, when you're going after wildlife, get the nouns and get them over with and move on to the verbs and the adjectives. What I'm talking about is, to me, a noun shot is anything that could have been taken at a really good zoo. And that's the close up of the lion and the close up of the giraffe and you know that sort of thing. Get those over with and then go after what animals are doing, you know, other than sleeping. Um, sleeping the lions, get them where they're paying attention, they're hunting, they're walking, they're doing all kinds of stuff. So then get the nouns over with and, and get those behind you and then go after the, the real shots. You know, these are the, what I call the noun shots. This is almost a noun shot, but it is, does show that it's not in a zoo. And then almost a noun shot here, but it's not in a zoo. So the scenics that I, I've shot over the years, these are just a, a, a few of them. Things that I that just say Tanzania to me and say Africa, the trees, the landscape. Uh, a lot of our friends say, well, that could have been Kansas. Well, it could have been, except those are baobab trees back there. Um, this could have been Kansas, except that's the Salil Swamp and uh, Tarangira National Park, raining and, and a lot of animals there in the foreground. You can't really see, they're very small. Another scenic shot. 2021, uh, our guide pulled up and stopped and told me, you need this shot. And I said, oh, man, that's beautiful. I sat there and took about eight of these. And I said, that's great. I got it. He said, look behind you. And I said, what? And I looked behind me. I had this going on, this old grizzled tree with a couple of uh, uh, eagles in it, tawny eagles and the moon going down. And I thought, yeah, that's why I'm with this company. Because the guys, are they know what photographers want. And they they pointed it out. I would have left without looking behind me. So, tree with all the uh, the weaver's nest in it, hanging from the branches there. Coming into camp one night. This is at uh, Nobby Hill. And then out on the horizon with this big thunderstorm, I used a big 800 millimeter lens uh, to compress the depth in this so that the clouds are boiling up there in the background with this one flat top acacia tree. This is in uh, the, the, the camp at um, Tarangira National Park, but it's actually outside the park. That white line along the bottom is Lake Manara. And then the, the Rift Valley, this is, we're in the Rift Valley. The back is where the uplift is occurring, um, or where the, actually where the, where the uplift is, where the land is staying the same and the middle is dropping. This is coming down from Ngorongoro Highlands and a mo little Maasai uh, Boma here in the foreground looking out across Serengeti Plains. Uh, thunderstorm going on in, uh, in Serengeti. This is in April, which is 
called the rainy season, but it's kind of like eastern Colorado. Things roll off the Rockies and have a downpour. Things roll through and have a downpour locally, very localized. And I, this is with a 100 to 400 millimeter zoom lens. So I shot this at 100 millimeter. You look on the right, there's a little hill there with a tree. I zoomed into 400 millimeter and took that shot. And it's a very simple composition, but it's one that I really like to, to show what it's like to be there. This is again, looking across the same the plains at a place called Gall Copies and a little group of wildebeest there. It's on the rim of Ngorongor Crater at the camp that we, we're using now. Looking across at one of the um, many little volcanoes around the rim. Early one morning, this is in, I know it was 2011, and we had our guide get up and drive us up here to get these shots as the moon, sun was coming up through the fog along the rim and um, got some amazing photos there. 7,500 feet along the rim. It was quite cool, and uh, we were wearing socks on our hands because we didn't have gloves. <laughs> so uh, if you go there and you go to, go and go to the crater and you're going to be on the rim early in the morning, gloves are kind of nice. This is departing uh, the camp at Nobby Hill early in the morning. I just I yelled for the driver, see mama, see mama, which means stop. And I got this shot of one of our vehicle ahead of us going out with the sun shining down through the limbs. This is at, uh, again at Nobby Hill, another early, early morning. This is 2021. Vehicle leaving first, and they stop because there's a couple of cheetahs underneath the tree there laying down. It's coming back into Nobby Hill at sunset. Again, it's it's what it's like to be there. And probably my most famous, uh, at least in my own mind, most famous uh, landscape photo is, this is Cindy. She took this with her. Her, her little Panasonic, and I kept looking at it, and I said, oh, yeah, it's changing. The light's getting better. So I started shooting with my 100 to 400 up on the rim at the lodge, and I braced there shooting away at this beautiful tree scene. And everybody that walked by me, and I'm not sure if Ellen did, but the people who walked by said, what do you see? I said, the trees. They said, you see elephants? I said, no, just the trees. And then somebody said, you see lions? No, I'm just photographing the trees. See any rhinos? No, I'm photographing the trees. Every single person walked by and asked what kind of animals I saw because they were focused on photographing animals. And they never stopped, except for Dwayne Graham stopped and took a couple of shots. And so we stopped for lunch a little later, and I forgot who was sitting next to me, but I was you know, chimping, looking at my photos. And I just looked at this one photo in the back of my camera and said, wow, where was that? I said, those are the trees I was photographing up on the rim when everybody walked by and nobody wanted to stop. So it's uh, there's a huge print of this hanging in uh, the Ministry of Forests in London, since uh, Tanzania was part of the, uh, the British protectorate at one time. And they wanted this image for their, for their offices. So the thing that people aren't really ready for when you get there is a sheer number of, of, of animals and the wildlife herds. This happens to be a uh, herd. Every dot you see in the background, the ones that are way out of focus even, those are wildebeest or zebras. This herd measured from where we're standing, looking all the way to the other side, was three miles. It was five miles wide. And uh, we had a, a, a park ranger there with us who said it was estimated at 1.2 million animals. And um, pretty impressive to see herds like that. In fact, for me, living in Kansas, first thing I thought I had was, wow, I know what the Great Plains looked like 600 years ago with all the bison. Another uh, wildebeest group, and this is this is sort of spread out, but they were spread out that day. This is from Gall Copies, looking back at Nobby Hill. And again, the animals all down across there, and they were spread out. The next morning we got up, they were all gone. None of them were there. The uh, the the migration migrating wildebeest eat 600 tons of grass a day, so they have to keep moving. So, so other thing that I look for, I call them environmental portraits. And the environmental is basically where do the animals live? What is, what does their environment look like? Like this is actually 2001. We're 150 yards from our tent. Very first morning in, in Tanzania. And our guide, we pull out of the 
away from the tents about 150 yards. He stops and then said, he said, do you want a picture of a lion? I said, yeah, where? And he points. Here's this beautiful male lion coming out of the woods, out of the brush and in the, the rising sun and it's just lighting his face up beautifully. It's all shot with Kodachrome 64. So ISO 64 for those who never shot film. A couple of Cheetah Brothers on a uh, termite mound. And I thought it looked pretty good in sepia. Wildebeest grazing uh, with a huge herd of Cape Buffalo way in the background on the left. And then the, the crater walls rising up behind the, the, the animals. And the, the backdrop there is spectacular when you're in the crater. A lone uh, giraffe heading across the plains after the sun has gone down. Sky is still a little pink. This is a, a hunting cheetah. This is a mother with two cubs, and she was hunting. And we um, will meet. You'll see some more of her a little later. A black rhino with some wildebeest laying there. This silhouette with again the the, the floor and the walls of the crater in the background makes for some pretty cool shots. And I really like these kind of shots. Here's an elephant and uh, some zebra behind the elephant walking along again, environmental portrait. If you look up on the on the backdrop there, there's a line going up it from left to right, goes uphill. That's the exit road. And uh, for those of you who have been there recently, that's all paved now. When we were there in 2007, Ellen, if you remember, it was a pretty treacherous dirt gravel rock road going up that thing. And I think one of the days we drove out, it was raining and pretty slick. So, and, and believe uh, me, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, and no handrails, no guard. No. <laughs> it, just, it was a white knuckle trip for some people. And then uh, this is a black and white in color both and the floor of the crater. All these flowers are beautiful, but they're invasive species and they're trying to get rid of them. So I'm using um, most of these that you've seen are either shot with uh, Olympus or, or Canon, and the later ones are all Olympus. This is Olympus here. I also use, um, I started using my iPhone. This is an iPhone photo. People want to know how close do we get to the animals. Well, it's up to them. We're parked on the road. They come to us. And people shoot with cameras, shoot with iPhones, shoot with a little bit of everything. So this isn't really an environmental, it's just a, it's a shot of what it's like to be there and how close we get to, to the wildlife. This is a, a mother cheetah and her cub, and uh, it doesn't really matter. You don't have, they, they don't have to be doing anything. They can be sleeping, but as long as it's got a baby in it, that's a, that's a good shot. Serval cat, um, and we got so lucky this thing walked over by the water and stood there and posed for us. Got a little reflection out of it too. And then I've started doing what I call super close-ups. This is a uh, this is 800 millimeter equivalent lens on a Olympus, and this lioness is really intently looking at something she wants to go chase. And I'll talk about our guides a little bit. I mean, I know I've, I've talked about how good they were at spotting. You know, you want to turn around and shoot behind you, and we were there with a, a, a male, a, actually a small pride of lions. And this male starts walking. The guy said, hang on. I said, we got to get a picture of the male. He said, hang on. I'm going to take you to a better spot. He drove us around to the other side of this lake or this water hole. So we get his reflection as he walked, walked along the water. So that's the kind of guides you, you want. You want guys that know what, what, what makes a great photo. And um, that's what's really been good about the company that we use over there. Post-up of a cheetah. In fact, this one's got a little bug buzzing its neck on the left side. And then I, I, I do these things for programs. I'd like to start, if I'm doing a program in Serengeti, I'd like to have this kind of a shot. And um, it wasn't really that color. I just went into the Lightroom and changed it to, to sunset colors and then put the title Serengeti in there. It's all wildebeest uh, that are uh, basically silhouetted against that color. Serval cat. Uh, this one's stalking. They use their ears to echolocate wildlife, uh, mainly mice in the grass. And then they pounce on where they hit, where the sound's coming from. And 
this is a serval cat doing a pounce onto a spot. Did three pounces of, and then the fourth one came up with a mouse. That's all, I've got a video of that, but I don't have any video on here. Um, coming back into camp, we got to get back before sunset, supposedly. And um, this lioness was lying alongside the road. We pulled up and stopped, and I got a couple of really nice shots at her with the sun going down the background. And now she's right at eye level because the road is eroded down below ground level. So we're looking straight across at her from the, from the windows of the vehicle. And then this uh, caracal, which is uh, really unusual to see. They're mostly nocturnal. And we've seen one pair of ears in all the trips we've made until 2021. We saw four, three or four, three or four of them hunting in the middle of the day, which is unusual. Group of lions going off on a hunt. They were sitting on the termite mounds in the background and they were watching a, a line of wildebeest go by and they decided it's time, we gotta get something to eat. So I had our, our guy drove us out and we get shots of them coming towards us as they're going out to hunt wildebeest. Uh, boar pans, if you don't know how to do these, practice them, they're fairly easy to do um, and you've, you get these running shots with the background all blurred and occasionally get one that's the animal sharp. You have a lot of throwaways, but the ones you get that are that are good are really good. Uh, Bohar Reedbach, this thing was running and it looked like it was going to run right beside the vehicle right behind us. So I set up and tracked it with my camera and then tried to time the shot as it, as it left off the, the ground onto the road. Um, a couple of cheetahs, and then you know how cats like water. It was a tremendous downpour, and I'm shooting out the window of the vehicle because the top is closed, and they're out there stumbling around trying to decide what to do. I mean, there's no place to go. There's no trees there that are nearby, and they're just getting soaking wet. This is a Cape buffalo. It's got a yellow-billed uh, oxpecker eating. Uh, parasites off of it. So it makes kind of an interesting shot with the, the color there and completely part of the horn. And again, a, a, a very tight shot. This is an Ingotorki, it's an Ingotorki, Ingotorki. It's a, a swamp area, a big, actually, actually springs, it's a water hole and it's got a lot of hippos in it and you can get out of the vehicle there. It's a picnic grounds. You get down to pretty low level in, uh, in the crater there and and shoot almost at eye level. And I noticed this one hippo kept coming up every 15 seconds and it'd come up, flip an ear, and then go back down and come up and not flip an ear, go back down, come up 15 seconds later, flip an ear. Every other time it flipped his ear for some reason. So I just waited for it. I knew where it was gonna be. I'd already pre-focused on that spot where it was and they don't move around much once they're in the water. And then came up and uh, flipped his ear for me. And I got this spray shot. Cheetah getting ready to go for a hunt. She's stalking something and moving quite gingerly through the grass, try to keep from attracting attention. Lion cubs in a rainstorm, and it was a not a whole lot of heavy rain, but it was uh, nice big raindrops that show up quite well in photos. This was a, a female leopard up in a tree, and she was just posing extremely nice for us. I just love the eyes of leopards. They almost look like, you know, they're looking at you like, man, I could eat you alive, you know, <laughs> carry you up in the tree. And then probably the most phenomenal male lion I've ever photographed was this guy. And I started shooting pictures of him, and I said, man, I know that guy from somewhere. He looks very familiar. And then it, then it, it dawned on me who it was. Looked just like... Uh, Clint Eastwood. Clint, yeah, it just looks, looks just like Clint Eastwood to me. So we named him Clint. Um, the baby elephant underneath its mom's legs hiding out down in there. I thought that was a kind of an interesting shot. A young black rhino with its mom. And uh, kind of hard to nuzzle when you got a horn, but I guess they can do that. And like I said, if it's babies, they're fair game. You don't, they don't have to be doing anything. They can be noun shots. And these, we had a, a 12 uh, cubs are approximately the same age in this one pride 
they posed for us, laid out in the grass, right, pretty close to our vehicle. These are all shot with a 300 millimeter lens. And it was pretty cool. Okay, I told you about that cheetah that, that um, was hunting. This is in 2021 in November. She had made a kill. We drove out to where the kill was, and she and the cubs are, it's a Thompson's gazelle. She and the cubs are, are tearing it apart, eating it. And I'm sitting here shooting with a 12 to 100, which would be a 24 to 200 um, full frame equivalent. I'm shooting still shots and video, a lot of video. And um, she set up. She stopped and let the kids have it. And then she took an interest in something over there and behind us. And I'm still shooting the 12 to, or the 24 to 200. And our guide said, I think she's going to hunt again. I said, you, what? He said, I think she's going to hunt again. And she did. She got up and got ready to take off. Excuse me a minute. And when she did, I, I threw down the 12, <clears throat> 12 to 200, or the 24 to 200 and grabbed my uh, 100 to 400 and tracked her as she made the chase with this, another, another gazelle, Thompson's gazelle. And I have a whole series of these. I just got a few on here. And in one of the hard turns there, the gazelle lost its footing, went down. The cheetah slammed on the brakes. I had a hard time slowing the camera down. I was moving so fast, panning with it, that I actually overshot a little bit. And then she dove back onto it, made the kill. And then, uh, like all good cheetahs, she drug it off into high grass. And they do that on purpose because they don't want the uh, vultures to find it because once the vultures are circling, then the other predators come in and steal it. Cheetah's only protection is speed. So they're actually able to go quite fast to get away from something. She's got cubs. The cubs would be doomed. Um, leopards climb trees. Lions fight off everything. Um, cheetahs only run. Roughly 10% of the cheetah cubs born in Tanzania make it to adulthood. 90% are killed by other predators or don't, or don't survive because of food. So let's, let's switch gears here a little bit. Um, I, I, I'm not a bird photographer. I never have been. I don't claim to be a bird photographer. In fact, my way of determining what a bird is, I put it on Facebook and say it's a bald eagle. I don't care what it is. And I guarantee you in about a second and a half, somebody's got to tell me, you idiot, that's a Dick Sissel. So then I go back. I, I got, now I know what it is. I go back and delete the posting. Now let somebody else do all the hard work of learning what the bird names are. And I go back and, and key, keyword them with uh, what they tell me. So, so we'll look at some bird shots from Tanzania. And the birds in Tanzania are pretty easy to get photos of, and they're very colorful. These are little... Uh, be little bee eaters, a pair of them there, and they 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 generally stay in one spot and they fly out and catch stuff and come back, catch stuff and come back. So constantly making returns. Uh, pelicans is down the crater. This thing is a uh, it's like a lark, but it's got real long claws on it. Now you, it's hard to determine with those spikes on that acacia branch, but it's got very very long claws. Uh, secretary bird, this is what they look like silhouetted against the sky. This is getting late in the day. And then walking through the high grass. Somebody said, why do they have such skinny legs? It's because they hunt snakes, okay? If I was hunting snakes, I'd want really skinny legs, <laughs> maybe sticks. Um, Black-shouldered kite. It's Hadata ibis. Lilac-breasted roller. These are all shot with... Um, 300, 200, 300, 400 millimeter lenses, uh, gray crown crane, woodland kingfisher, um, one of the lovebirds, yellow colored lovebird. Probably the ugliest bird you'll ever photograph is one of these things. It's a ground hornbill. It's got a bunch of insects in its mouth that it's caught, or maybe one big one that's all mutilated. Uh, Southern Bishop. This is a uh, red-billed oxpecker that it actually 
Its wings retired, so it's called an Uber. It has to be a warthog Uber, but it's, you rode around that thing for 10 or 15 minutes. Saddle billed storks, kind of an unusual bird. Um, this is a, one of the eagles. It's a, uh, no, it's a high crowned. I forgot, forgot the exact name of it, but it's a, it's one of the eagles. This is a, also a martial eagle. I'm sorry, this is a, a tawny eagle. Yeah. Post, it's up to, they're always looking at stuff. They, they were looking at us with that one eye. Uh, a group of flamingos. Now, I didn't think I was going to get a shot of these. They took off way off in the distance. And they kept going in a spiral bigger and bigger. And finally, they came by me. And I got pretty good shots of them, the, the two or three passes they made. White-fronted bee eater. This is a Barose eagle owl. It's kind of unusual. It's a pretty good size owl, but it also has, I don't know if you can tell in the photo here, pink eyelids. So when it blinks, you get these flashes of pink on the screen and it's really kind of cool. I shot a video of that so you can, uh, that I have that's with the, the flashing pink. All right, a little bit of, uh, this is, this applies no matter where you go. It doesn't matter if it's Tanzania or, or the Yellowstone or anywhere. You're looking at the world through a small window, a little bitty, you know, everybody's got that camera up and they're looking at, you're seeing everything that way. I, I, I suggest that every once in a while, just put the camera down. You don't have to be looking at everything all the time and just look around and, and look and see what's behind you like I should be doing. I, fortunately, I take my wife, she looks behind me, but look around, look behind you, see what's there, smell the air, Listen to the sounds, what's going on around you. It's kind of absorbed the whole experience. And I guarantee you what happens when you get back home and you're going through your photos, you can smell the air, you can hear the, the birds, the sounds, and you're back on safari again. It just comes back to you because you've taken the time to imprint that in your brain, what's there. Now, showing the combinations that we used, uh, 2001, 2017, Ellen will recognize these. Uh, this is the tents at Knobby Hill, sitting out front, uh, Dwayne and Emily. Inside, pretty nice, you know, nice bed, uh, places to hang clothes up, wash basins, lots of bottled water, lanterns that are solar charged with batteries. And this is from back in the back room. And then you, go, you can go out through the, through the back of the tent into another little enclosure. There's a a bag shower with warm water, you can just like you're camping or a camping tower. Uh, and the other side, there's a chemical toilet like being a camper. So that's the way it used to be. This is what we're doing now. Same place, this is Knobby Hill. These are the tents we're in. They're, they're pretty similar inside, I think, except for the tables. It's got like, some chairs, it's got a couch, it's got a, a massive bed, uh, chandeliers, all electricity, places to sit over. Uh, at a desk on the left there and download your pictures. Sit there and look out across Serengeti. You go behind the bedroom, behind the bed. There's a, a, a bathroom back there that's got a flush toilet, running water. They got a shower with hot and cold water year, uh, 24 hours a day. And uh, a sink in the middle there. And giraffes that walk right through camp. So it's, uh, it's a little different than it was back in 2001, 2007, it's, it's really grown up. And then 20, 2019, 2020, when COVID hit, the company that we use never let anybody go. They brought them into the camps and they rebuilt camps. And so now this is a, a camp, this is on the, it's within Ngorongora Crater, but it's up near the rim. And these are called tents, even though they look like a cabin, they're canvas on the outside, this is the inside. Um, the spot is a tent. Uh, this is a tent we're looking at here. If you look at the, if I go back, if you look at the ceiling in there, you can kind of see it's uh, ripple. That's the tent part. The walls are canvas. And uh, there's, this is the bathroom. Tile shower, bathroom, you know, toilet. I mean, and then you got a sink setting on, on uh, marble tops or granite. It's crazy. That hair dryers. There's a deck out back. You can walk out, sit out there, and look down in the crater. It's our daughter on the left, and uh, a friend, a friend who went on the trip with her. That uh, they shared shared accommodations. 
Sumitu Camp, and I don't, we didn't go there, Ellen, but Sumitu Camp's turned into my favorite place. It's in the middle of nowhere. It used to be very, very rugged, not very rugged. It was uh, comparable to the Navi Hill stuff, but a little, about the same as the, the real nice tents at Navi Hill now. They've changed it all too. It's all the same kind of cabins. This is the bar. Um, you've got all, everything you want in that bar. It's pretty cheap. This is a sitting area outside the bar. The dining room is in the far background there. Uh, all out there along the, the grounds are swings and chairs and tables and fire pits. So you sit out there at night with a fire going and, and uh, look out and see the stars. And it's pretty impressive. Very well kept. Cool place. Anyway, it's looking back at the bar. Just and then the uh, the area where people come in and congregate when you first arrive. And this is one of the cabins just before sunrise. The thing there on the left that you may not be able to see very well is uh, that's the solar collector for hot water. Each of the cabins has its own solar power panels. It's all solar powered. It's got a big bank of batteries in it. Everything runs off those batteries the whole time you're there. Uh, so it's uh, it's been quite well quite well accepted by everybody that went. This is the the first group that we had in 2021, and I'll tell you that the uh, smiles are included free, so we don't charge extra to put those on. Now, Ellen, um, that was 2007, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just to prove that she was there in the vehicle in a rainstorm, we're racing along, and I'm in the back seat. We we uh, we chose to ride together. <laughs> so that's uh I think we had seen a tornado, believe it or not. They brought somebody from Kansas so we could see a tornado. This is up at the remember that Maasai camp thing that where they had all the paintings and the stunt rocks and the fire pit, and that was really cool. And then this is Looking out across uh, the Serengeti, taking photos and and again smiles. The the three chicas that hung out together. Yeah, I still look like that too. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, and <laughs> we have this uh, these four zebras. They're between two copies. I didn't explain what copies are, but copies of the the tops of the old mountains that were before the volcano filled in between everything with ash and they have eroded down to these piles of rocks like you see in the the, the uh, Denver Zoo and that's there's two sets of lions on each side of them and they're quite nervous and I remember Ellen was standing next to me because I, I was taking these photos and I took this one and she looked over at the back of my camera and said oh that's cool how did you know to turn it vertical and get all the, the sky in that and I just said you don't live in Kansas do you and we both laughed about that because it's all about the sky in Kansas. So uh, we have to include that in our shots. Okay, so after COVID and losing, having all my hair turn gray, uh, we decided we're not going to go to Tanzania anymore. Our daughter's been with us twice. She helped us on boat trips with, uh, with people there and getting things organized. And so she's doing her own trips. This is in... 2017, this is the old fire pit at Sabitu Camp. Those are all Cape Buffalo back there. And we're sitting out by the fire pit uh, talking to Jonas, who runs the camp. This is a little bit about uh, our daughter. She's got a, well, there's a whole list in the next page. But uh, she and Ellen, oh yeah, I think you, you know her, Ellen, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, in fact, she helped me get my certification. Oh, okay, good. Well, she's one of 20 certified professional photographers in the state of Nebraska. Uh, she got a Bachelor of Science. I'll just skip over this. Bachelor of Science in Portrait and Commercial Photography from Central Missouri State. Um, 23 years as a working professional photographer on the board of the Professional Photographers of Nebraska. She teaches basic photography, lighting, and wedding photography. And when I told her I'm not leading any more trips, she said, Dad, I'm going to. It's cool. Go for it. Um, so she's leaving. Um, third, week, third week of April? Yeah. Third week of April for to lead her first trip to Tanzania on her own. And she said, I could show you a couple of her pictures from previous trips. Here's one. With the, the cubs all looking for someplace where they can nurse. <laughs> Except the one that's got a, in, a, in a milk coma there, on the, two of them in the milk coma laying on the ground. Um, 
she's done quite a bit of black and white that she really likes. And then this, this lion face just, just looks regal and, and tough. Elephant butts, they're walking away from us on the Serengeti. And then probably my favorite photo of hers, and I don't know why I like it, but it's just, it's it's borderline funny. It's uh, ostriches with all their babies. 20-some-odd babies. 20-some babies. And there three sets of adults. There's only two sets in this photo, but they're all walking around together out there in the middle of nowhere. And they're hurting, keeping these babies with them. It's pretty cool. One of the shots I really like. And then this is uh, our daughter. She had to get a shot with her professional photographer's in the Nebraska shirt on there. And then her contact information. If anybody's interested, she's doing another one. November 24. Um, she does well, have one opening. She has one opening in April if somebody can move quick. Um, she could accommodate two, but basically has room for at least one. And uh, on, for the May, April, May 23 this year, you have to move really quickly to get that if you wanted to go. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to be having a shoulder surgery. So I can't even pick up a camera for about two months. All right, try to answer questions. Anybody has any? I'll, uh, I'll get this off the screen. I don't know how I'd just like to throw out that um, that Jenny was super helpful. I went and visited her. She's she's up in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Right. And when I was working on my um, certification, I needed. Um, I just needed some advice. They uh, had just changed all the rules for certification. And and so very few people knew how to do the um, the the testing. And but Jenny did. So I drove up to Lincoln, Nebraska to to have Jenny go through my photos with me and and help me understand how to complete the certification process. This was oh God, well, it was before COVID. So it must have been in 18 or 19. And she took me to this ice cream store in downtown Lincoln, and I got to go back there because it was so cool. The name of the, it was like a, a micro creamer, creamery because it was like gourmet ice cream, and it was called Ivana Cone. <laughs> and I am so, I hope it's still there, but if you ever have to go through uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, make sure that you go downtown to Ivana Cone and then also stop into Jenny's studio. I'm assuming she still has her studio in the downtown area. Yeah, she actually has closed it down and she's doing everything on location now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't blame her since that was before COVID when I, when I visited her. Yeah. She did in, during COVID, she did something called porch portraits. I saw those. She did a great job with that. Yeah. And she donated half the money that she made off of those. In fact, I think almost all the money yeah. she made off of it went to uh, buying lunches for underprivileged children who normally would get a free lunch at school. So, Holy cow. That's a, she got written up in the newspaper and everything for doing that. So it's pretty cool. Yep. She knows what she's doing. She handled, she's, we, she helped us on one of our trips where we had a, uh, a guy with some medical issues. Not that he got him there. He, he already had him before he got there. So <laughs> we just didn't really we didn't know it. But she was quite quite helpful. So. Jimmy, I have a, a question. Yes. And 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 a comment. I'll I'll do the comment first. I really enjoyed uh, your your talk, by the way. Peg and I were in Tanzania in 2016. And the one thing that I would have done different is I would have taken more video. Yeah. And, and if it wasn't for Peg when we were looking at giraffes and she said, well, why don't you take a video of those? Because <laughs> they, they, move, they move both legs on one side, which is right. a lot different than most ungulates. And I go, yeah, that's great. And you're going to go through a lot of camera cards when you do video. I didn't do a lot of video, but I did enough to condense it down into a few minutes that really captured what we saw out there in addition to the thousands of still. Um, my question is, um, you know, you're going along in the safari vehicle and you see animals. 
So you have to be set up, you know, to shoot. So my question is, do you set up on shutter priority? And do you have a certain cluster of points that you have on focus set up already? Or how do you set your camera? Okay, yeah, I, I'm always, I'm, I, would, I hate to use the word always, because just you right. know, like for blur pans, it's a whole different world. But for, for the most part, I'm an aperture priority. And I'm, I know I'm doing that. The reason I'm doing that, the, the 100 to 400 lens I've got is, uh, is tack sharp one stop down from wide open. So that's where I shoot it all the time. Unless I'm trying to get a lot of depth of field. So I use that and then I adjust ISO based on what I think I'm gonna be shooting. And that, that takes care of the shutter speed for me. So if it's a bird in flight, I'll go you know 1200 ISO or something. But the, for the most part, I'm somewhere 400 to, to 800 ISO. And, and are you shooting, uh, is that a Canon lens that you're shooting, the 1 to 400? No, it's actually, it's a Leica 1 to okay. 400, but it's on a, it's on a, it's made, it's designed by Leica, made by Panasonic, and it's on an Olympus camera, so. Okay. You know, it's a, it's a goofy setup, but it works really well. And it's autofocus, it all works together, so. And, and I do, I, well, we'll say something about video. Um I shoot about half of what I shoot's video now. I've been doing that for about, started shooting video probably 2016, 2014, 2012. I shot, 2011, I shot a little bit of video, but at the next trip, I shot a lot of video. And what I've been doing at the end of the trip, I put together a, a video of the, you know, eight minute synopsis of the trip. Nobody can stand still long enough to watch a 20 minute video, you know. Right. So I, I make an eight minute synopsis. I send it off to, to everybody that went on the trip. And then they can show their friends on their own television what it was like. Cause that's, it's, uh, it, you know, you invite everybody over, come over to my house, we'll look at pictures from Africa. Yeah, right. And, I, and everybody gets bored. Nobody wants to do that unless they think they could go. Uh, so video, if they say they got a four minute video on sure, you don't tell them it's eight minutes because then they won't watch. But if you tell them it's four minutes, <laughs> they they get so intrigued with it they watch the whole thing. So, and do you choose a certain uh, cluster of points for focus, or do you focus no. across the whole mat? Uh, if it's birds in flight, I got a center center cluster. If it's uh, for everything else, I use a single point. Um, now, if, you know, I and I've got it the, the back of the Olympus <laughs> cameras has got a joystick that I can move the focus point around while I'm holding it, looking through the viewfinder just with my thumb. So I can I can steer it where I really need it. Uh, but yeah, I just use a single point for almost everything. I had a question about uh, using those bean bags. Do you turn your VR off for that like you would with a tripod? What was that again? The the vibration reduction on your lens, would you have that off if you're using a bean bag or do you leave it on uh, more like a handheld? I, I leave it on all the time. Uh, Even on tripod? Um, yes, I've never had to turn it, I've never turned it off. Uh, you know, the way those things work, um, I know everybody, there's two two schools. Some people say turn it off, other people say leave it on. Um, I'm I'm never quite. I mean, I'm not. If I'm doing night shots, I'll turn it off on a tripod. But for regular daytime shots, I'll leave it on. I don't see much of a. I don't see much of a difference. But again, the uh, Olympus cameras have got in-body image stabilization. It actually moves a sensor around for stabilization, which uh, it's about six stops. I've actually shot fireworks at three and a half seconds handheld with about eighty-five millimeter worth of lens. And they're tack sharp. It's just, it's. I mean, I. It's from the world I came from. Shooting, we, you know, you had to brace and everything. I just hold it up and shoot. I, I've done interviews where I zoom in the middle of the interview, handheld, with a, with video, and it just looks like it's on a fluid head. It's incredibly sharp, uh, uh, well designed for doing that. I, I mean the. I, I don't know. I went to Olympus because I got tired of carrying all the big gear. And I actually was stopped going into Peru with my Canon gear. They wanted me to pay $2,000. Yeah. 
They want to pay $2,000 to bring my gear to their country because I'm making money off their country, right? And and the girl, the lady in customs, her English was poor enough that I just kept acting like I didn't understand what she was saying. I faked it pretty good because she finally just said, just go on. So I didn't have to do it. And I came back and said, I'm not going through that again. And I want to get something lighter. And I, you know, I, I, we went to uh, Scotland. I took nothing but, but uh, uh, I had a, a Panasonic and a Olympus micro fur thirds, a little bitty cameras, the real lightweight, real lim small lenses. And I came back and looked at them. I couldn't tell them from what I've been shooting with the Canon. I said, except at high, really high ISO, I could tell the difference. But other than that, it was so good. I said, I'm, I'm sticking with this stuff. And I sold all the Canon gear and I started building up my uh, Olympus supply. So I've got probably the latest Olympus cameras and the lenses are amazing. They've also got some technology that, um, like I do a lot of bird stuff now that when, I like to get them a, just as they take off a sequence. Well, they got a thing called Pro Capture. That's you, you in that mode, you put it on the bird, you push the button halfway down, it starts shooting, but it doesn't save anything. And as soon as you see the bird launch, you push the button the rest of the way down, it saves from that point forward, plus everything that's still in the buffer that hadn't been deleted yet. So it goes back about two and a half seconds in time. And you, so you go back and get the exact point that the bird took off. Everybody said, wow, how'd you time that? So I said, I'm good, you know. <laughs> but I've also used that for daytime lightning. So I'm setting up, I got lightning going on and I sit there with a the button pushed halfway down. As soon as I see the lightning bolt, I push the button the rest of the way down. It, find, it goes back in time, two and a half, three seconds, depending on what, what I've got it set for. And I got the lightning strike. Daytime, no lightning trigger. I mean, the first time I tried that, I had a $300 lightning trigger. I sold it the next day. So I don't need this thing anymore. I've got this I can do without. Pretty, pretty cool. Now they're only 20.2 20, 20 megapixels, but they also have a high speed, so the sensor moves around. It, I can shoot a 50 megapixel shot handheld. And what it does is you go and it shoots, it smooths the sensor half a pixel, all these different directions, adds it together and gives you a 50 megapixel shot. And I thought, that's in, that's in, insane. How, who came up with that? It turns out it was CIA spy satellites. So <laughs> back when they didn't have 50 megapixel sensors, you know, they had, they had eight, four and eight megapixel. They figured out a way to move the sensor around to get, get uh, higher resolution. So. And there's some some real genius in the, some, the Olympus gear. The problem is you've got to use it every week, or you're, you're sitting there going through the menus trying to figure out how do I set this up again? I forgot. You know, it's the menu system, the menu on it, uh, on the older ones, the ones I've got, um, would would drive anybody insane after a while trying to to do everything it'll do. I mean, it, it's I I didn't touch the the uh, long exposure thing. It's it, there's a it, at night, you can go out like you've got your cityscape and you want to get car and headlight, taillights and headlights, set up on a tripod, you take one shot and it gets the whole city. And then it says, okay, I'm ready now. And then you, and you push it and it takes a shot every, whatever you set it up to do for how long you want it to do it. And it, uh, it says, oh, all the pixels that are in that first shot, I'm locking those out. We're not going to use them. So it doesn't accumulate. They don't get brighter. They stay just at the exposure you did in your first shot. And it just keeps adding headlights and taillights streaks. Does that make sense? It's, I mean, I, the technology is incredible in that little thing, you know? So, I don't know. To shoot 4K video, uh, really good 4K video. Uh, I'm, I'm hooked on the OM1 thing now. It's got a, a menu that I can understand. The newest, newest one, and it weighs next to nothing. The whole camera um, is quite small. And What's the sensor size on it? It's uh, well, it's uh, it's slightly bigger than an inch. You know, diagonal. Does that make it bigger or smaller than a micro four thirds? It's a micro four thirds. Oh, it's it is. Micro, okay. Yeah, it's micro four thirds, which is like I think that's four thirds of an inch diagonal. 
one and one and a third inches diagonal. So it was. It's just. Um, I don't know. I I'm not. I don't get anything from Olympus. I don't really care. I just. I, you know, for me, it's lightweight, and I can carry it. And the other thing I found out, I don't need to. I don't have to have such a huge tripod anymore. And I carry a lighter tripod, and I'm. I'm more likely to have everything with me than to have. You know, I mean, there were times going to Africa, I'd say, okay, which one of you is going to stay home? I look at all the Canon lenses and you're not going, you're not going. I did an interesting thing. I went into the Lightroom and I went into the, uh, did a search on by lens. And I put keyword Tanzania. How many shots did I take with my 24 to 105? And it came up so many. I said, no, I'm not taking that lens. How many did I take with my 17 to 40? Oh, okay, I'll take it. You know, and then I had uh, 100 to 400. How many, to, you know, and so I could pick out what lenses got to go based on what I did the last two trips so, and what I had to stay home because my bag, um, it was getting to the point where I had to hire somebody to carry it. My wife can't do it anymore. So, <laughs> so. any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, Jimmy, you, you had mentioned that you set on aperture priority. Yes, lens. and and that's a that's a, like a lens in your in your camera. Is is that a two eight lens? So oh no, it's it's slow. It's a five, seven, six. It's a seven point one at four hundred okay. millimeter. It's, All right. it's it's four to seven point one. So so you're probably setting the aperture at f eight or so. F eight, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not a full stop down, but f eight it's short. right. Okay. F7.1, you start getting some soft areas in the corners. F8 is pretty sharp everywhere. So yeah. Across a flat plane. Right. But, there, you know, the, uh, Olympus came out with a new lens. About, well, they announced it two years ago. They do this a lot. They announced it two years ago. They didn't, didn't release it for all year. And uh, then when it came out, it's a 150 to 400 F4 with a 1.25 teleconverter built in. Hmm. You got this huge, you know, uh, stabilization system that works with the camera in conjunction with the camera. And I thought, man, I got to get one of these. And they priced it at seventy five hundred bucks. And I said, I, I, I'm pretty close to getting that range right now, and I don't need to spend any more money. So I haven't. I, I was on the list, and they called me and said, "Well, you ready for it?" And I said, "No, give it to somebody else. I don't want it because I'm I'm fine with what I've got." I haven't seen a need for anything long. You know, 100 to 400 is like 200 to 800 on that camera. So it's a, it's a 2X crop factor. It's smaller than APS-C. So. so when you start thinking about, I got eight, 200 to 800, what, what am I going to gain with this other lens that gets me to 800 or 980 or 950 with a teleconverter built in? Don't need it. That's, you know, it, it, the thing about an African, you know this, uh, you start worrying about heat waves, you know. It's long enough lens, it's it's heat waves, right? I actually well, one one year there with my 3028, I had a 2X and 1.4 stacked on it. And I put my crop camera on my 7D Mark II, and there's a leopard in a tree quite a ways away. It's, for, it's the first time I've ever done this. I put it on a high-speed motor and I, I bracketed focus. <laughs> Because I couldn't tell was it focused or not. It wouldn't focus with the heat waves and, and with all that stuff in there. I just went and kept uh, held the button down and rotated the focus frame. And finally got some sharp, you know, a couple, I got five or six sharp shots out of it. But, you know, when you got that kind of heat waves, you just got to be picky about what you do. So creative. That's Bracket. crazy. Yeah. Sorry, I, it's, I, got on, I got off on a tangent to talk about equipment, but. No, nope, it's, all, it's all good. Does anyone have any more questions? This has been great. Well, I will say your, your images are stunning. Just beautiful. Well, thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's, you know, it, I mean, when you got so many to throw away, it's okay. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't keep them all. But uh, the other thing that, that the Olympus, I shoot it in silent mode. I should have I should have said that. I don't I it's you know it's a mirrorless camera. So I shoot it in silent mode. And low speed silent silent is 30 frames a second. High speed is 60. 
And you can fill up an SD card in a heartbeat at those rates. It's like shooting video. So I shoot, and I can, I can tone it down. I've got it set at 18 low speed and 25 or 30 on high speed because I don't need 60 frames a second, you know. It's, so, but it's, it, I come home with way too many images. And then I spend the next three years, you know, getting cataracts, looking at my screen, trying to delete stuff. So just, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate your um, all the time that you've taken and and all the wonderful knowledge that you've shared, Jim. This is this has been great. Yeah, go to Tanzania and there you drink, go. if you do, drink a keely for me because I don't. They can't get them here. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Okay. Well, thanks everybody.